Welcome back to this review of Sex and Culture, Unwin's 1934 masterwork that predicts cultural collapse for the West by 2060. Unwin illustrates his concepts using some helpful diagrams. Starting with an inactive, inert human society, he energises it to show the six states of energy historically produced by the seven classes of sexual regulations. State 1. This inert society is the nucleus, the zoistic cultural condition, at a dead level of conception, figure A. But what if this society begins to place restrictions on the satisfaction of prenuptial impulses? State 2. Some energetic individuals will credit a newly dead magician with still possessing the same magic power as he had possessed when he was alive. The tombs of these powerful dead men will be decorated. Offerings will be made to their ghosts. Huts will be built over their graves. And eventually, similar huts will be built where the power in the universe is manifest. These individuals will then separate themselves from their zoistic brethren, forming a manistic belt around the zoistic nucleus. Figure B. The next stage involves making sure the prenuptial sexual impulses of the females are not satisfied at all. State 3. This produces even greater energy. The huts become temples. To uprising generations, the powers manifest therein appear as gods who have charge of all human and natural activities and rule them in an arbitrary and personal manner. In the consciousness of the most developed stratum of people, a sense of the past develops. They then separate themselves, forming a deistic belt outside the manistic belt, so that the society now consists of three cultural strata, figure C. That is what Unwin says gradual energization looks like. But introducing prenuptial chastity suddenly means there is no manistic stratum. The most energetic individuals think of one power only. Their temples are erected to that power only. Separating themselves from their zoistic brethren, these people form a deistic belt around the zoistic nucleus, figure D. It is very important to realise that all these processes are reversible. Unwin points out how the Roman woman enjoyed a greater sexual liberty under the eus gentium than the eus civili. Absolute monogamy was modified, sexual opportunity was extended, sexual desires were expressed in a direct manner, the marriage institution fell out of fashion, women were emancipated, the marital and parental authorities were qualified, Roman gravitas disappeared. This can go one step further as well. The disappearance of irregular or occasional continents will mean the manistic stratum disappears. The society will become zoistic again, but some cultural items produced during the monistic period will remain. So far, Unwin has energised the experimental society to such an extent as to bring it into the deistic cultural condition. To advance it further, post-nuptial sexual opportunity must be reduced, introducing some post-nuptial dissatisfaction. State 5. A modified form of polygamy will mean it stays deistic as long as it retains prenuptial chastity. But if the male as well as the female is compelled to confine himself to one sexual partner, the society then expands and explores, conquering less energetic peoples. Unwin gives the British Empire as an example. The sexual opportunity of the English was reduced to a minimum, the stringent law being accompanied by the same marital and parental authorities as among the early Babylonians, Athenians, Romans and Anglo-Saxons. The English were deistic and monarchical. Soon they began to display tremendous social energy. They founded the greatest empire which the world had ever seen, established a large foreign commerce, sent out colonists to every part of the world. This expansive energy does not create a cultural change. It is simply the form of behaviour adopted by societies which have reduced their sexual opportunity to a minimum. 
It results in a number of lusty individuals forming an expansive belt outside the deistic and manistic belts. But the cultural condition remains the same. Figure E. Suppose the males are then permitted to have more than one sexual partner. The society will then cease to display expansive energy, but continuing to demand prenuptial chastity will mean it remains deistic. If a man's wives are compelled to confine their sexual qualities to their husband for the whole of their lives, the society is likely to preserve its conquests as well as its culture. But if it relaxes its sexual regulations further, it collapses. Remember, there will be a time lag. A society, Unwin says, appears in the pages of history displaying an energy produced in the two previous generations. But to see the effect of the sexual opportunity it enjoys when we first hear of it, we must search the records of the next century. But suppose it doesn't relax its sexual regulations. Instead, it keeps sexual opportunity at a minimum for at least three generations. There are only three indisputable instances of this. The Athenians, Romans and English. The cultural effect of this energizing far exceeds anything achieved so far. The energy increases, indeed, in what seems to be geometrical progression. The society expands in all its multifarious activities, exhibits a terrific mental energy that is manifest in the arts and sciences, refines its craftsmanship, changes its opinions on every conceivable subject, exerts considerable control over its environment and manifests its potential powers in the loftiest forms yet known. Not only is its inherited tradition augmented by the products of its abundant energy, but it is also refined by human entropy. Consequently, a rationalistic stratum separates itself from the main body and forms another belt outside the deistic one. Figures F and G. That, Unwin's research revealed, is how human energy is produced and exerted. But he notes that in the past, no human society has displayed great energy for an extended period. And in the next video, we'll look at why this is.